Guten Abend. Uh, es ist mir eine große Freude, Sie hier begrüßen zu dürfen an einem wirklich ähm, wichtigen Tag für unsere Institution. Mein Name ist Martin Bunzel. Ich habe die äh, Ehre und Freude, diesem Haus vorzustehen. Und ich habe äh, die große Freude, äh, dieses Event einzuleiten, eine Veranstaltung mit äh, Timothy Snyder, der... Äh, also wirklich ohne, ich neige zur Übertreibung, sagt man mir, ich weiß nicht, ähm, wirklich einer der, der bahnbrechendsten Historiker äh, unserer Zeit ist und äh, der uns sein neues Buch hier präsentiert. Das äh, Event hier ist eine Koproduktion, eine Kooperation zwischen dem Wien Museum und dem Institut für die Wissenschaft von Menschen. Und diese Kooperation ist eine so großartige, sie geht sogar so weit, dass das IWM uns diese wunderbaren Stühle zur Verfügung gestellt hat. Wir sind das, wir sind das Museum der Stadt Wien, wir können uns keine schönen Stühle leisten, weil wir sind sehr arm, aber das IWM hat uns großzügig unterstützt und dafür ein riesiger Dank und ich gebe mal jetzt kurz weiter an die Rektorin des IWM, Charlene Randiera. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, auch von meiner Seite aus ganz herzlich willkommen seien Sie zu dem heutigen Abend. Ich möchte mich nicht nur bei Matti Bünzel und dem Wien Museum hier bedanken, sondern auch noch bei der polnischen Botschaft, weil es eigentlich unser Termin mit einer Vorlesung von Philipp Ter kollidiert. Und das ist die Reihe, die mit der polnischen Botschaft zusammen an der Uni Wien organisiert wird. Und wir haben einfach entschieden, die Vorlesung soll heute Abend hier stattfinden. Und daher haben wir auch äh, hier äh, das Glück, äh, Philipp und äh, seine Studenten begrüßen zu dürfen. I'm very happy that both uh, Dirk Moses and Philipp have accepted our invitation uh, for this evening. And just two quick words and I'm done. One, I think, uh, it, for those of you who know Tim Snyder well, you know that he is a permanent fellow at the IWM and we're very, very happy that he's going to be talking about a book which he wrote at the Institute last year. Um, the other uh, announcement which I would like to make is that he's going to be available. Later you can pick up a copy of the book outside and he's there to sign the book after the event. And as Mati Bensel just said, this is one of one event in which we are cooperating. The next event, we will still lend you the chairs for it here, <laughs> uh, will be a, a book discussion of Ilya Trojanov's new novel, Macht und Widerstand. He will be talking to Philip Blum here. And for the third event, we are not lending you the chairs. We are having the event at the IWM. It's Mati Bunsel talking with Helga Novotny about her new book, and that is The Cunning of Uncertainty. So these are three book presentations which are in cooperation with the Wien Museum, and I'm very, very happy that this is the case. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shalini, and thank you for, for being in Vienna. It, um, you, you, you raised the the intellectual temperature of our city in, in wonderful ways. And uh, so we've seamlessly switched from German to English, which is, which is you know, how we like to do things. Uh, very briefly, an introduction for, for, you know, Tim and Dirk and Philip. Um, Timothy Snyder is the Bert White Hossoom Professor of History at Yale um, University. As Shalini mentioned, he is a permanent fellow at the um, Institut für die Wissenschaft von Menschen. He's the author of a number of pathbreaking books, and again, I'm just keeping this short, so I, I'm just going to give you the titles just so you have a sense of the range of his work. Um, the, the book that I first encountered, um, which was published in 2003, was The Reconstruction of Nations, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, 1569 to 1999. It gives you a sense of the extraordinary scope and range of Tim's scholarship both in terms of historical uh, dates and in terms of uh, linguistic uh, capabilities. Uh, Tim is one of those people who commands just about every language imaginable and uh, is able to make interventions based on that knowledge. Another book, um, 2008, 
uh, wonderful book, The Red Prince, The Secret Lives of a Habsburg Archduke, um, about Wilhelm von Habsburg, um, a, a page turner, uh, beautifully written. And only the overture to the book that uh, made him a world figure uh, beyond the academy, uh, Bloodlands. I'm sure many of you have read it. Um, Europe between Hitler and Stalin, a, a truly new, you know, very provocative um, interpretation of uh, Europe in the middle of the 20th century. It was translated into 30 languages, won numerous prizes. And it may yet be an overture to the book that he's here to discuss with us, Black Earth, uh, The Holocaust as History and Warning, which was published last month, is about to be published uh, in, in German, or has just been published in German, and is already creating a huge discussion and uh, will surely be uh, a marker for um, the way we think about the Holocaust now and in the future. Tim has been called many things, and I'm just going to pick my favorite quote uh, from the New York, um, New York Times, uh, called Tim, a public intellectual unafraid to make bold connections between past and present. Uh, he frequently writes for the New York Review of Books, my favorite journal in the world, and uh, uh, in some ways, and I, 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 it's maybe inappropriate to mention this, but um, I mean, I, I, as a scholar in the U.S., I, I grew up, grew up as a scholar worshiping Tony Judd, and uh, you're, you're, his successor, and that's, and, and those are big shoes to fill, and you, you're filling them, and that's we're very grateful. Um, Dirk Moses. Uh, Professor of Global and Colonial History at the European University Institute in Florence, a very, very fine intellectual historian. He's the author in 2007 of a book called German Intellectuals and the Nazi Past, and a forthcoming book titled Genocide and the Terror of History, The Quest for Permanent Security. He's also, among other books, um, the editor of the Oxford Handbook on Genocide Studies, a very, very important work. Philip Thea is probably personally known to many of you. He is a professor here at the University of Vienna, Universität Wien, the Institut für Osteuropäische Geschichte, the uh, Institute for Eastern European History. Uh, he also is the author of numerous books. I'm simply going to mention the two latest ones, very important monographs. Uh, the 2011, Die Dunkle Seite der Nationalstaaten, Ethnische Säuberungen im modernen Europa. And in 2014, Die Neue Ordnung auf dem Alten Kontinent, Eine Geschichte des Neoliberalen Europa. Uh, the way this evening is going to proceed is that Tim will uh, step up to the podium and give us an overview uh, in the form of a, a brief lecture, uh, the main points of Black Earth. And uh, the, the three of them will then proceed to a conversation that will uh, discuss the issues and the implications. I thank you again for coming this evening, and I thank these three for taking part in our event. Thank you. Thank you, Fellini. Thank you, Matti, for these very kind words of introduction. Thanks to, to Dirk and Philippe for, for being with me to discuss this book. Meine sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich werde, ich werde mich auf Englisch ausdrücken, nicht weil das zu kompliziert für Sie ist, aber das, weil das zu kompliziert für mich ist. Also, es, es kommt auf Englisch jetzt. What I'm trying to do in this book is to provide a convincing or at least a plausible explanation of the Holocaust. What I'm seeking to do is to find a way to connect Hitler's thought to the simple reality that tens of thousands of people killed millions of Jews. And this is a problem. It's not a problem that's easy to solve. At first glance, the fact that Hitler's ideology is so radical might seem like an answer to the question. The fact that Hitler envisioned the world entirely in racial terms, that Hitler saw the world as a theater, as a scene, as a backdrop for racial struggle, and that Hitler's guiding idea was that the Jewish problem was that Jewish ideas prevented that struggle from continuing. Let me just pause for a minute and try to explain just how radical this idea is. Hitler works against essentially every tradition of philosophical, moral, political, and religious thought. 
Hitler's contention is that insofar as any of us see the rest of us as human beings, we have been influenced by Jewish ideas. So rather than criticizing any particular idea, communism or Christianity, let's say, the move that Hitler makes is to say that all of these ideas are really one idea. All of these ideas are the Jewish idea of humanity, the idea that one should see other people across racial lines. So in this way, Hitler dispenses with Christianity, he dispenses with communism, he dispenses with the rule of law, he dispenses with the state in the sense of a neutral place where people can be citizens. He dispenses with every tradition that might stand in the way of continuing racial warfare. Now, two points in this idea I want to, I want to draw out particularly. Because when I say every idea, I think Hitler actually means every idea, including some ideas that we've forgotten. If I tell you that Hitler was against communism, I'm sure you know that. If I tell you that Hitler believed that Jews were communists and communists were Jews, I'm sure you know that. If I tell you that Hitler was against Christianity, um, you might doubt for a minute, but it's the case. If I tell you that Hitler, for example, said that St. Paul and Leon Trotsky were essentially the same person, you might shake your head for a moment, but you'll see the logic. For him, Christianity and communism are essentially identical ethical traditions, because all ethical traditions are identical. What's a bit more surprising, or what we're more likely to overlook, is the fact that Hitler also saw science, at least science in the sense of universal science, science that could bring progress to everyone. He also saw this as a Jewish trap. In what I think are the most forgotten passages of Mein Kampf, Hitler, Hitler rails against irrigation, and pesticides, and fertilizers, and the hybridization of crops. Why? Because he believes that world Jewry is using these technologies to lull Germans into a false sense of security so that Germans won't understand that their destiny is actually to struggle for land. So while Hitler saw technology as real, he also saw the promise of universal technology, just like the province of, promise of universal ethics, as one more Jewish trap. Why is this so important? It's so important because it leads very coherently to his idea of Lebensraum. What Hitler calls Lebensraum, I call in the book ecological panic. Hitler's idea of Lebensraum is the notion that we must, beginning right now, beginning immediately, struggle for more land. Now, at one level, this is a very clear idea. The idea is that since we are races, since there is only so much land, since there's only so much arable land, we need more so we can propagate our race. We must destroy other races, take their land, propagate our own races. But um, the idea also has a political component. So it has a biological component, the invocation of races. Races are like species. Species must struggle, therefore we must struggle. But it also has a political component. The political component is this. Hitler says, science can't save us, so we have to survive by taking land. But he also says, science can't save us, so if we want a higher standard of living, we also must take more land. These two appeals, these two sides of Lebensraum, Lebensraum in, this, in the biological sense, and Lebensraum in the sense of Gemütlichkeit, right, of family life, run side by side in his writings and then come together. And the political sense is actually extremely important. Hitler writes very explicitly, and one must admit perceptively, about lifestyle in his second book. He says that the German family doesn't compare its standard of living to other German families. He says, thanks to modern media, German families, thanks to radio and the newspaper, compare their standard of life to the American way of life and that Germans will never be satisfied until the German standard of living is the same as the American standard of living, which means that standard of living is relative, it means that standard of living is subjective, and it means that it will always need to be higher and higher. So Lebensraum involves two different ideas of, let's call it, insatiability, 
We must have more and more land and food to survive. We need ever more, but we also must have ever more land and food in order to have a higher and higher standard of living, okay? Or to put it in more emotional terms, what Hitler is saying is, let us strip away all of these ideas that he categorizes as Jewish, and let us experience two crucial emotions. If you are afraid about the future, you are right to be afraid, and you should strike out and take whatever you can. Or, if you want more and more things, if you want your house to be more and more comfortable, that's right, and don't let anyone tell you different. Just keep taking more and more. That's natural. That's you. That is the way that you ought to be. And when we reach this point, we realize that the politics of racial war, the politics of Lebensraum, are, are, are perhaps not entirely as distant as we might want them to be. Now, Lebensraum is not just biology and politics. Lebensraum is also geography. Lebensraum for Hitler is a particular place, and in Mein Kampf he makes this very clear. The particular place where Germany is going to get Lebensraum is Ukraine. Ukraine is the most fertile part of Europe, he thinks correctly. Ukraine is the place which will allow Germany to become self-sufficient, which will allow German families to become prosperous. The entire plan to gain Lebensraum is centered around Ukraine. For Hitler, Ukraine is a kind of magical place where all of his ideas can come together. Ukraine is governed by the Soviet Union, so if one attacks the Soviet Union and kills Jews, it should fall apart because Hitler says the Soviet Union is a Jewish state. Ukraine is populated by people Hitler regards as an inferior race, Ukrainians. So as soon as German power arrives, the local people can be starved or enslaved as necessary. And finally, Ukraine is the place that has the territory which will change German life. That's the idea. That's a little bit of the politics. But how does one get from those ideas to actually marching into Ukraine in 1941 and killing hundreds of thousands of Jews? The first part of the answer, which I'd like to provide, has to do with the state. Not the state as it's normally presented in our stereotypes of or our historiography of the Holocaust, not the German state as an impossibly perfect, unbelievably classifying, bureaucratic, authoritarian entity. That's not the story that I wish to tell. Germany in the 1930s did not carry out a Holocaust inside its own borders, nor could it have carried out a Holocaust inside its borders. Why? Because Hitler faced a basic dilemma. Hitler was a racial anarchist. Hitler was an ecological anarchist who then gained control of a state. That's not a solution, that's a problem. What do you then do with the state? Hitler's answer, I think we have not yet found. This is what I believe it is. Hitler's answer is you transform the state in such a way so that it can destroy other states. The racial transformation he has in mind cannot happen in Germany. Germany is too small, it's too decadent. The racial transformation he has in mind can only happen abroad. The only way that Germany can achieve its destiny, thinks Hitler, is by way of a particular kind of war. Now, if we think about German history this way, then we're not stuck in the 1930s, as I'm afraid much of the historiography is. You cannot explain the Holocaust only with the 1930s. It's important that Hitler comes to power. It's important that he transforms the German state. But to what purpose? To what end? To the purpose of destroying other states. Now, exactly how this is going to happen, Hitler cannot predict, and he doesn't know it. But as a general rule, what the chronology of the Holocaust is, is the move of German power beyond Germany into other places so that Jews can be increasingly humiliated, expropriated, deported, and eventually killed. So the way to think about German history in the 1930s, I think, is essentially a matter of the potential to carry out a Holocaust. Let me try to give this to you very briefly in terms of the numbers. 97% of the Jews who die in the Holocaust. 97% lived beyond Germany. 
The Holocaust as an event is something which happens beyond Germany. The entirety of the Holocaust takes place in a zone which German power deliberately rendered stateless. Now, if I want to make this argument not in terms of numbers, but in terms of chronology, which I'd now like to try to do, the thing that I would want to, imp the thing that I would want to emphasize is each country as a kind of site of encounter between German power and Jews, and each country as a site of escalation. So let's think again about German racial power or Nazi racial power inside Germany. What is the SS for? Is the SS to transform Germany? A bit, but not so much. It has limits. The SS governs over concentration camps, which by definition are zones of lawlessness or zones of statelessness. What the SS provides is the potential to transform other countries. And what the concentration camps mean, what they are, are examples, templates for what can be done in the lands beyond Germany. So let's consider in this light what happens in this city, in this country, in March of 1938. In Austria in the 1930s, there were not Nuremberg laws. There was not a progressive discrim legal discrimination of Jews as there was in National Socialist Germany. Nevertheless, on the 11th of March 1938, Jews were massively humiliated in Vienna and in other Austrian cities in a way that was not possible in Nazi Germany. Why? Because the Austrian state from one day to the next ceased to exist. Now, why is this so important? Because in the destruction of a state, we see the first major step between Hitler's ideas and their realization as micropolitics. If the Holocaust is going to make sense, we have to see how these vast planetary ideas can actually be realized on a small scale. Let's say Ringstrasse, right? How does that happen? Well, in Austria, what happens is that when the old regime goes away, when, when a new regime is coming, Austrians, most of them not national socialists, gather around Jews who are scrubbing the streets. What does this mean? It has a double significance. The first significance is Jews, for the first time, on such a large scale, have been separated from the rest of the population. But the second significance is the one I want to draw your attention to. What are the Jews scrubbing from the streets? I assume that many of you Viennese know this. It's not that they're just scrubbing the streets to be humiliated. They're scrubbing one word from the streets. They're scrubbing the word Österreich. Österreich. That and that alone. Why? Because on the 15th of March, there was supposed to be a referendum about Austrian independence. The Jews are made to scrub the whitewash, the paint of Österreich, from the streets. They're not only being humiliated, they're being associated with the old regime. They're being made to take the responsibility for the old regime. The people standing around them wearing swastika lapel pins are separating themselves both from the Jews and from the old regime. And the responsibility goes to the Jews. And when the Jews disappear, as they will before too long, most of them to Minsk or to Belarus, the responsibility goes away as well. Consider for a moment Czechoslovakia. Okay, now I'm doing something I'm aware that's very different, right? Usually we spend most of our time talking about Germany and other countries are just footnotes. But if we want to understand the Holocaust, we have to know the places where the Jews lived, which was not for the most part Germany. We have to understand the experiences of non-German Jews. If we're gonna make an argument as I'm doing that the end of structure is very important, we have to have a sense of what those structures were. So. Czechoslovakia, it's destroyed in 1938 and 1939. What happens to its Jews? The Jews of Slovakia are subjected to a moment of statelessness. When Czechoslovakia ceases to exist, they float free. Then they are redefined in the new Slovak constitution as second-class citizens. This creates an artificial um, Jewish question, as Slovak leaders said at the time. Impoverished Jews without property rights suddenly seemed like a problem. And that was resolved not long thereafter by sending tens of thousands of those Jews to Auschwitz. The first Jews sent to Auschwitz in large numbers were the Slovak Jews. Further east in Czechoslovakia, in a place called Ruthenia, much of the territory was taken by Hungary. 
Hungary in this new territory, Ruthenia, which it takes from Czechoslovakia, does not extend citizenship to Jews. What happens to those Jews? Well, when the moment arrives, a, couple, a year or so later, Hungary expels those Jews into the Soviet Union, right into the path of the Wehrmacht. And those Jews will then be the victims of the very first mass shooting, the first shooting on the scale of more than 10,000 in the Holocaust, and for that matter, in the history of the world. So the destruction of a state in 1938 and 1939 is the beginning of a process which will lead to things that are more familiar to us, mass gassing and mass shooting. When we move to Poland, we see something which is still more drastic. Poland in 1939 is the first state that German power destroys under the cover of war, right? So behind the Wehrmacht come the Einsatzgruppen who are tasked precisely to destroy the, German, to the, the Polish state, to remove the institutions, but also to physically murder the Polish political class. And they do kill tens of thousands of Poles, educated Poles, by the end of 1939. German doctrine about Poland is very interesting. The idea is that this is a colony. This is a place which doesn't exist and has never existed. Its people are not citizens of anything because there never was a Polish state, right? Um, and this means that the Polish civil code ceases to, ceases to function. That may seem like a banal statement, but it's extremely important because it means that, for example, Jews lose their property rights right away from one day to the next, a process which takes five years and is never fully complete in Germany, happens in Poland literally in one day, and the loss of Jewish property rights and also other rights means that they can be moved into ghettos. But let me signal a couple of other, what might also seem to be very small, transformations, a couple of other ways that destroying the state allows ideology to become micropolitics. Consider the Judenrat. You probably think you know what the Judenrat is. You probably think the Germans invented the Judenrat, and in some sense that's true. But the Judenrat was in fact, in Poland, the same people who had been in charge of the Jüdische Gemeinschaft what was called the Gemina, um, or, or the, or, or the Kehelot, the legal Jewish institutions of local autonomy of interwar Poland. In interwar Poland, there was local Jewish autonomy. Every town and city had a legally organized Jewish council, which was responsible for things like birth, death, marriage, kosher slaughter, taking money from abroad. Those same men who ran Jewish autonomy then became the leaders of the Judenrat. They did very different things as the leaders of the Judenrat as they did before the war, but what changed was the situation. There was no longer a Polish state, but rather a German occupation authority. Consider the Polish police. Poland also had Ordnungspolizei. They also called it order police. In the late 1930s, the Polish order police spent a lot of their time sitting in Polish market towns trying to prevent pogroms. Why did they do this? Because anti-Semitism was very widespread in Poland, because the main opposition party, the National Democrats, was encouraging pogroms as a way to intimidate Jews, but also to challenge the state. And so the Polish order police, defenders of bourgeois law and order, defenders of the rule of law, spent a lot of time stopping pogroms. That's what they did. Now, take the Polish state away, Put the picture ahead three years, and those same men are in the Polish countryside hunting down Jews and shooting them. Were they protecting Jews in 1939 because they liked them? Not necessarily, right? Were they killing them in 1943 because they didn't like them? Again, not necessarily. It's the same people, but what has changed is the institution. Now, that said, ghettos, Polish police, end of civil code, Judenrat, that still does not create a holocaust. Germany invades Poland in 1939. Mass killing does not come to Poland until 1942. What happens in the meantime? What happens in the meantime is the invasion of the Soviet Union. And the argument that I would like to make is that the special thing about the Soviet Union was that you had two overlapping experiences of state destruction something which had never before happened, I think it's fair to say, in history, where modern states were destroyed one after the other in the matter of just months. Let me be clear about what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the Germans did what they did because the Soviets did it first. I'm not saying that Stalin is worse than Hitler. 
What I am saying is that the fact that Germany, that, that the Soviet Union destroyed Estonia, wiped it from the map, destroyed Latvia, wiped it from the map, destroyed Lithuania, wiped it from the map, and took part in the destruction of Poland in 1939 and 1940, create a political situation which is very special when Germany moves in in 1941. In the book, I spend a lot of time trying to explain what this double occupation means, but here I'd just like to focus on one element of symbolic politics. Think back to the Austrian middle classes on the Ringstrasse or around the first, sixth, second district, third district in March of 1938. Think of those groups of people um, wearing the swastika lapel pins and the Jews scrubbing the streets, removing the word Österreich. Okay? Now think of July 1941 in the, Polish, in the Polish countryside or the Lithuanian countryside. Something very similar unfolds. Peasants, Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Russians, all take part in things like this. Peasants in the countryside, given an example by the Germans, who do this in a very dramatic fashion in Białystok, teach, take Jews, force the Jews to carry statues of Lenin, to carry the statues of Lenin into a synagogue or into, into a barn, and then burn the synagogue or the barn. Now, this politics comes from the Germans. This happens for the first time in Białystok in June of 1941, when German police force about 2,000 Jews, along with Lenin statues, Soviet music, into a synagogue and burn it down. But the symbolic politics is understood. As in Vienna in 1938, so in Eastern Europe in 1941, people understand the symbolism. If you associate the Jews with Lenin and you burn them both, then responsibility for communism goes away. Now, why is this so important? It's important not because the Jews were communists and the communists were Jews. I'm going to return to this point in just a minute. It's important because it's a lie. Jews were not responsible for communism any more than they were responsible for Austria. But the moment that an old regime goes away, it makes extremely good micro-political sense to put the responsibility on a group and then for that group also to go away. Now, double, occupa double occupation leads to the Holocaust in a number of different ways. But I'm suggesting that one of them is double collaboration. When we look at the Soviet Union and we look at this complicated East European zone of overlap, our temptation is to say the Jews did this, the Estonians did this, the Poles did this. The main dynamic, I think, is a political one. The main thing that happened, or one of the main things that happened, was that people who had been collaborating with the communist regime instead ch chose to attribute responsibility for communism to, Pol to Jews in that way clearing themselves. That's a political dynamic. It's one, by the way, which the Germans very often didn't understand. It almost never appears in German sources. Interestingly, the people who notice it are the Jews. In Jewish sources, Jews say again and again, my neighbor collaborated with the Soviets, now he's collaborating with the Germans, and he's blaming communism on me, right? That's one example of how double occupation matters. What happens then, broadly speaking, in the East, is that a dynamic forms where more Germans than expected are willing to carry out mass murder. The, what the Germans don't know is that when they bring their own people into the stateless zones of the East, they'll be willing to kill. Not just the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen are just part of the problem. The German order police, very often people with no special training, kill more people than the Einsatzgruppen. The Wehrmacht are relatively easy to bring into the killing. So the SS, the police, the German soldiers, along with ever more local collaborators, are able to kill by shooting close to a million Jews by the end of 1941. It's this, I believe, that shows the top German leadership how a final solution is possible. In the zone of statelessness, ever more forms of political technique are developed, which allow Jews to be killed in large numbers so that in late 1941 or early 1942, Hitler can make clear that what he would like is for all the Jews to be removed. Now, what happens then, and here I must be very brief, is that Jews survive in the rest of Europe insofar as conventional political institutions remain. German policy is now general to kill all Jews everywhere, but its implementation is actually very strikingly 
uneven. In, in a place like Estonia, 99% of the Jews will be killed. In a place like Denmark, 99% of them will be survived. This is not because of a difference in German policy or of a difference of local attitudes. It's because of a difference in the nature of occupation. If you want West European examples, in France, 75% of the Jews will survive. In the Netherlands, 75% of them will die. Is that because the French were less anti-Semitic? No, certainly not. It's because the nature of the occupation was different. The SS were in the occupation in the Netherlands. In the city of Paris, speaking of France, in the city of Paris, who were the main victims of the Holocaust? The Polish Jews. The Polish Jews. More Polish Jews were killed in the French Holocaust than French Jews were. Was that because there were more Polish Jews in France than there were French Jews? No, of course not. That would be absurd. It's because the Polish Jews do not have citizenship. There is no state protector. Or looking at the issue from the other side, although it's very uneven and each state, each nation has its own story, as a general matter, a passport would protect you. As a general matter, bureaucracy would protect you. And sometimes even foreign policy would protect you because sovereign states which allied with the Nazis could change their foreign policy in the middle of the war. If there was no sovereign state, there could be no change in foreign policy. What does this mean if we think about perhaps the most fundamental chapter of the Holocaust, the history of rescue? It means that looking at the issue calmly and coldly, the people, most of the people who could rescue large, number, large numbers of Jews were diplomats. Why diplomats? Because diplomats, unlike most people, were sure of their own status, and diplomats, unlike almost everyone, could extend state protection. So whether it was the Chinese consul here in Vienna who gave out 2,000 visas to Jews, whether it was the Japanese consul in Kaunas, Sugihara, who saved thousands and thousands of Jews, whether it, were, whether it was American or Portuguese or Spanish diplomats in the Balkans or in Iberia, it was diplomats who could do this because they represented the state. At the other end of the spectrum, where people were helpless, where no one was a citizen, in the blackest zone, in the zone of statelessness in Eastern Europe, very few people rescued. Thousands, tens of thousands, but very few. And this is, this is in a way where history ends or where historical analysis ends. Because if you read the thousands, in fact, the tens of thousands of Jewish sources that are present, there are far more Jewish sources than people believe. They're just in Yiddish and Russian and Polish. If you read the Jewish sources about the people who rescued them, to a surprising, to an astonishing extent, the Jews are unable to account for the motivations of those who rescued them. And the rescuers are even worse at explaining what motivated them. And I think the reason for this is very simple. They didn't have motivation in the conventional sense of the word. They were not anchored in institutions or norms. Institutions and norms were gone. The people who could rescue was that very, very, were that very, very small minority whose own sense of virtue or whose own sense of normative behavior did not change when institutions changed. Now, sadly, this was not very many people, which leads me to my conclusion in the book. I did not, the last few chapters are about the rescuers, but I don't want to end with the rescuers because I think that strikes a false note. It is, of course, right and good to remember the rescuers, as we do in our museums and in our books. It is, of course, right and good to consider them exemplary. But what I think is not realistic, and what I think is perhaps wrong, is to make that the only lesson of the Holocaust. The rescuers were the people who could act virtuously when there were no structures. It fought, for me at least, it follows from that, that one of the lessons we should draw from the Holocaust is to make sure that there are structures. If statelessness is one of the causes of the Holocaust, we should perhaps be more attentive on both the right and the left to the value of the state as such. If ecological panic is one of the causes of the Holocaust, then we should perhaps think more broadly about the relationship between our own habits and the future in the 21st century. I tend to think that if we have a broader interpretation of the Holocaust, which is not just about ideas, but about how those ideas, thanks to ecological panic and statelessness, work their way into micropolitics, work their way into individual decisions, we will also have a broader platform from which to understand genocide and mass killing around us, and perhaps a more useful set of perspectives to think about the threats which we all know 
are facing us now in the 21st century. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Basically, go. Um, there's a microphone. Um, well, good evening. Uh, first of all, thanks to the IWM for the wonderful cooperation. Thanks for the invitation here. And, and Tim, also personal thanks for many years of really fruitful intellectual exchange. Thanks for being, you know, that, that you also took me here. Um, when I read your book, and I greatly enjoyed reading it, um, it in, the be in the very beginning, it took me to kind of a time journey to late teenage years, um, you know, I went to, I attended a, a monastery school and there was a library, it was in the uh, German-Austrian borderlands, and in this library, Mein Kampf was not under censorship, it was just standing in a bookshelf, and I was really curious because it was forbidden, right? So, I took it out and I started reading. And well, then many years later, I read it again as a student, but there always was the same sense of kind of hmm, disappointment, right? That this is quite incoherent, uh, aggrandizing, and I always had the impression that one cannot understand national socialism through the writings of Hitler. Even later on, you know, when I, when I read, um, you know, Reichstag speeches and other things, one gets a clearer picture, but, but still, then there is so much propaganda and camouflage in there that, again, it is very difficult. But I think even the same, you know, can you understand um, an, an, a little ideology like this through writings? Um, I think even with Stalinism, it, it would be difficult. So Stalin was a much better writer and thinker than, than, than Hitler. And so, by and large, I would say, um, National Socialism, you know, it proclaimed that action um, as ideology, in fact. I think it was I ideology in action. Mm -hmm. And so, I think this is uh, maybe an issue we should discuss, or maybe a problem of the book, that this action then had its own dynamism. Now, there's many very complicated, of course, then, you know, Holocaust explanations, functionalism, and, and so on. Um, but I think this, this action is at the core of it, and much less so the ideology. Now, within the action, you stress the destruction of states. Um, and here, there is a problem because I think the percentage of murdered Jews, if you deduct the number of Jews who still had the time to go to exile, right, to leave the country. Uh, in fact, I think it is rather independent of state destruction. So here I really wonder about, um, you know, about this causal explanation, which will be my final point. So the rate of deportation and of killing of Jews who remained was very high, for example, in the Netherlands, in parts of Belgium and Flanders, uh, also in Bohemia and the Protectorate, in relation to the to the general population, uh, the victim rate was not that much different from from Poland. That that was the result of uh, another book project. It's a couple of years old, but also you might know it in, in English, the Aryanization and uh, and Restitution book. And there actually, you know, that was the surprising result that the victim rates are not that different. And well, if then you know the statehood and the occupation regimes don't matter that much, then probably the degree of collaboration of the, of the local society, but also the institutions, is the key thing. And, and that brings me to the, to the question, what is then statehood? And I think destruction of statehood or anarchy, um, I think it is highly problematic, because if you look at those countries which I mentioned, Austria, Protectorate, um, and so on, um, it was a continuity, and especially in Austria, and in certain ways also an expansion, totalization of, of statehood. So a change, 
and not the destruction. And even in Eastern Europe, um, Poland, Serbia, um, you know, anarchy, I don't, I don't see it. Isn't the main development of the Holocaust, the dynamics, that you have the mass shootings in 41, 42, very much so, but the longer it goes on, uh, the mass destruction gets then more and more organized. So that, you know, uh, the mass shooting, indeed, that's important, and that's, you know, what, what is your important contribution to the whole debate, that the mass shootings are so important. But um, later on, after all, I would say that the gas chambers became, or the organization, bureaucratization, became, um, became more important. And that finally leads to the, to the issue of explanation. I completely sympathize uh, with your approach to use history as a source of explanation because it basically means that, you know, we had this long thread of cultural history where, you know, there was this focus on the how questions. And now we get more to the why questions. So this I find uh, remarkable and, and, and important. Uh, but then one needs to distinguish very carefully whether um, things are connected, correlated or dependent or interdependent, right? And, and I see that, you know, the destruction of states is connected with the Holocaust, but um, you can also deport a huge number of Jews, almost as high, um, with a functioning state, like those Western European cases or Central European cases. So that is basically, um, you know, um, a, a, a major doubt. But correlation, I see that the previous Soviet rule was correlated um, with then the mass killings, right, in the stretch of Eastern Poland, Western Ukraine, and so on, which you mentioned, Baltic states, um, because there the Nazis could exploit the mutual hatred which had risen under Soviet dominance, um, well, existing grassroots anti-Semitism, you mentioned all in your book, and of course the myth of the Jido Komuna, so the Jews as the bearers of communism. Um, but is that really, you know, dependent on, the, on that? And so I still would insist that actually the Holocaust is dependent, and that's another de degree then, on murderous and murderous and murdering institutions. But for that, then, you know, your focus on Hitler and his, his ideology might not be that, that far reaching, but you need to, to understand the motivations and, and the actions of the tens of thousands, which you mentioned in the very beginning of your, of your talk. So this would be my, my, my brief comment. Okay. Yeah. Should I, you want to answer? Me? Okay. So, so thanks. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be, try to be relatively, tell you brief because I want to hear what, what Dirk has to say. First of all, I want to say how happy I am that, that, that uh, Philippe Ter um, has, has, has joined me and that Dirk Moses has joined me. These are two people who have influenced me over, over years and each of them is, is a pioneer in his own way in this particular field, field of study. Um, Philippe has done so, did so much in his early and in his later work to make deportation and ethnic cleansing Weberian concepts really in the whole discussion of the history of, of, of Europe. And, and Dirk Moses is largely responsible for the globalization of Holocaust studies as a field and thereby making possible in ways I'm sure I don't even completely understand a lot of the arguments I'm trying to make. Let me just talk, try to, try to close the gap a little bit between statelessness and causality because you're right, I, 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 I lay the challenge out myself. If you're going to say ideology matters, and you're going to say that one has to under understand the Holocaust at a micro level, how in fact do you make that bridge? I think that's a challenge for, for everyone. I think the Holocaust itself demands that we take Hitler's ideas seriously because he actually describes fairly closely what's, what is eventually going to happen. But of course, as, as Philippe quite rightly says, we have to understand the individual people and, and what they are doing. So how useful is the invasion of the Soviet Union for describing the beginning of the Holocaust? One very simple point that I would make is that that is in fact when it does begin. Right? So any alternative theory of causality would have to explain what alternative set of situations might have brought about the beginning of mass killing. As a matter of fact, the mass killing begins with the invasion of the Soviet Union. So then we have, we're forced to ask why. And this is the question which I think has been incompletely answered in a historiography which is dominated by German sources. Because in this world, many things are happening which the Germans themselves do not understand. So for example, the fact that Jews have already been expropriated, right? Expropriation is what the Soviet Union 
did. That was its job. It takes Germans five or six years to do it. The Soviets do it in a week. It's not that they just expropriate the Jews, they expropriate essentially everyone, but in the East European lands we're talking about, much of the property, especially in cities, was owned by Jews, which means when the Germans come in, the local non-Jews say, you know, that was my shop or my apartment, and the Jews can never get it back, and there's one more motivation to kill them. Um, another thing which happens when Germany invades the Soviet Union is that Germany brings with it a very special kind of collaborator. The fact that the Soviet Union had already destroyed these Baltic states meant that you had tens of thousands of political immigrants to Germany. And what the Nazis did in the intervening year or so is they selected the few of these people who they thought were sufficiently uh, fascist, anti-Semitic, and clever and brought them back with them where these people literally served as the translators of Nazi ideas into local languages in massive waves of radio propaganda, which recall, for those of you who have studied it, Rwanda. Um, and without the, so the prior Soviet invasion, then this, then this kind of propaganda wouldn't have been possible. And of course, there's the general sense of emotion, of shame or humiliation, which comes when your entire country has been destroyed. I think this is something that, that Austrians have a sense of, right? The experience of 1938 to 1953 defines essentially your entire national identity. But what if instead of a long period of more or less occupation, Austria were destroyed from one day to the next by a massive foreign invasion, right? Or Germany, or France, or any country. This creates a set of emotions which can be broadly channeled, and that's what the Germans were so successful in doing. So there were a number of mechanisms, not just, so not just that the SS comes in in 1941 with orders to shoot Jews for the first time, although that's true and that's important, and thank you for reminding us of that. Not just that so many Germans were willing to kill in that set of circumstances, but also there's a possibility for local politics. As the state in general, um, in the book what I try to show is that, and I can't do it here because there isn't much time, but that although you're, you're quite right that institutions play a part, it's the way that institutions are wrapped up in the destruction of other institutions which turns out to matter. If you look at all of Europe, and I agree with you, the Jews, I mean, the Jews who managed to flee German power is a different story, but Jews who are present when German power arrives, it does seem to me that institutions are extremely important. Every case is different, but if we look at it fractally at ever lower, level, ever lower levels, I think we do see the general rule. In Bulgaria, the Bulgarians have a nice story that they rescued their Jews. And Bulgarian Jews did survive, where did they not survive? Precisely on the territories where they lost citizenship, Thrace and Macedonia, which Bulgaria conquered. Romania had its own anti-Semitic policy, effectively had its own Holocaust, killed about 250,000 or more Jews. Where? Almost exclusively, 94% on territories where Jews lost citizenship, where the Soviet Union took territory and Romania came back. Um, every, at every level you look at this, it turns out that the passport or the change of regime or the change of borders is actually rather significant for the fate of Jews, regardless of where they came from. It's, I think it's a fairly universal phenomenon. Statelessness is the extreme. Statelessness is the extreme, but as you go down the ladder of experience, of experience towards normal sovereignty, Jews are at ever more risk. In the Netherlands, the special thing about the Netherlands, and why the Netherlands is such an important example for me, is that Netherlands was the one case in the West where the SS ran the occupation, as they did in the East. Amsterdam was the one city in Western Europe where the Nazis actually considered setting up a ghetto. They were, they were, treating, they were treating the Netherlands as they were treating Eastern Europe, and in that respect, you can understand why the murder of Jews in that, in that rate was so high. But I fundamentally agree with your basic point, which is that ultimately we have to be able to see people in their settings to, and, and get to their motivations. With statelessness, what I tried to show with the example of Vienna in March of 1938 or, or Yedvabna in, in, in July of 1941 is that we can sometimes do that and it's the breaking apart of institutions and their rearrangement which can somehow, sometimes help us to understand why people are doing what they are doing. So anyway, thanks. It's terrific to be here. Uh, this is a very important book. Uh, it's a very prophetic book. Uh, it's a very political book. You'll see that when you read the last chapter in particular. I want to build up to the, the political element and perhaps smoke you out towards the end of our discussion, but I'm going to begin with quite a specific question as a way of sort of cutting in to the text and then what, seeing if we can fill it out. And it's a curiosity I have about your argument, if I understand it correctly, 
that the Nazis decide ultimately upon mass murder of Jews and not deportation, so it's a replacement and a radicalization, because they realize they're losing what Philip, sorry, what uh, Tim calls the colonial or imperial war against Slavic East Central Europe towards the end of 1941. As I understand the argument, as they realize that the expansive war of destruction against the Bolshevik state is failing, they will be unable to deport beyond its borders all these Jews they've become uh, in possession of in conquering Poland and Ukraine in particular. Therefore, in an act of, it's either frustration or revenge, I'm not sure, I'd like Tim to answer, they embark on mass murder. Uh, if that's true, that's uh, an account of your argument, then I wonder how that sits with your initial chapter and statement on Hitler's worldview, where it's clearly murderous from the outset. Now, if Hitler is in the optimistic phase of the anti-Bolshevik, anti-Soviet anti campaign, uh, just an ethnic cleanser like everyone else in Europe at the time, then, then I'm a little confused about how all this sits together. So I'm asking just for some clarification. Okay, so um, it's, I think, all coherent. My presentation might not have been coherent, but unfortunately I think Hitler's presentation was coherent. What, 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 what Hitler... Yeah, no, this is the sad thing about totalitarianism, is that it's coherent. It's not true, it's fictional, but it's coherent. And the question is, by what means one is drawn, by what experience, this goes back to Philippe's question, what experience one is drawn into this story. And, and, and part of my argument, and Philippe has to be right here, part of my argument is that it's not that everyone believes in Hitler's ideology from the beginning. Almost no one believes in it from the beginning. It's not clear that Himmler believed very much of it, honestly. What is important is that you generate experiences which make parts of the ideology seem plausible. In particular, if you can get people to kill Jews, in the, this is a good example, actually. If you can get people to kill Jews in the name of Judeo-communism, they will almost always, if not always, afterwards say that Jews are communists and communists are Jews. So if you can bring people into a certain experience, then the ideology becomes the only explanation for that experience. So it is coherent. Hitler's view, I think, is coherent. And there, there is an answer to this question, and it, it goes like this. Hitler simultaneously presents the struggle against the Jews and the struggle against the Slavs as being codependent. What should be happening in the world, since Germans are a higher race and Slavs are untermenschen, what should be happening in the world is that Germans should be overwhelming Eastern Europe and immediately taking all this Lebensraum. It's not happening because of an essentially Jewish world order, which means that every attempt to restore nature always has these two levels. At, at one, on one level, which, which thanks for remembering this, which you call colon, which I call colonial, the Germans are going to conquer inferior people and take their land. At another level, which I call anti-colonial, they're going to struggle against the Jewish control of the world. The idea being that the whole world is a Jewish colony, right? And so the Germans have the arguments of the strong against the weak, but also the arguments of the weak against the strong, as as, as they see it. This is simultaneous in theory. And that's why the attack on the Soviet Union makes so much sense within the theory, because the Soviet Union is the place which has both a Jewish state, as Hitler sees it, and all of these Untermenschen who are controlling such fertile territory. So as I see it, Derek, with, with, within the argument, you have the political resolution, which is why I'm not actually so close to the kind of Christian Gerlach argument that you first they try one thing and then they fail and they try another. As I see it, this tension is built in, or this fruitful tension, unfortunately, is built into the theory, because the theory says, the reason we don't conquer territory is because of the Jews, which automatically means if you fail to conquer territory when you try, it's the fault of the Jews. So if the Germans fail to conquer territory as they expect in September, October, November 1941, it's not that Hitler has to say we failed in one thing, let's do something new. It's rather just a shift of emphasis because both things are there from the very beginning. 
Um, well, I, I would come back to your to your first response. Um, well, probably, probably there's a little, uh, you know, maybe a too, too, too detailed discussion because what you pertain to, Dirk, was rather, you know, the main explanatory schemes of, of, of Holocaust, right, and uh, the, the whole escalation theory. Now, you know, you stress 41, you're right. Um, still, I mean, a lot already happened in 39 after the invasion of Poland. So, you know, sometimes I also have the impression that we might overstress... Um, the change of Nazi policy in the sense, you know, hell break loose when they invaded the Soviet Union, even before, um, I think this is also the, the recent research on, on the war in Poland has, has shown how, how horrible that has been, including, well, still mainly the deportation of Jews, but also already killing, you know. Um, well, with a, an elite bias, certainly, uh, rather intellectuals, professors, teachers, and so on, but, but still it was already there. But let me come back to this discussion about statehood, and I hope this is interesting enough also for the audience here, because it's a very detailed thing, of course. But when you now mentioned um, Romania and Bulgaria, you know, I'm not so sure that this is an issue of statelessness, what happened in Macedonia or in Transylvania. I think, or what happened in areas of Ukraine, where you have the longest tradition of let's call it local or regional autonomy with a strong impact of, uh, of the OON, the Organization of, of uh, uh, Ukrainian Nationalists. I mean, where they, you know, where they have um, a mayor and, and can do their things for a number of years, uh, like in parts of, of Western or Southwestern Ukraine. Um, I think in these areas, the killing of Jews, the, the death rate, which you mentioned, rightly so, um, I think it is particularly high because these, also these local societies, they test a new form of statehood. And the new form of statehood is that of an ethnically homogeneous society. And, well, then how they proceed might vary, right? Sometimes they just deport and they say, okay, you know, the Nazis, please take those Jews and, you know, have them uh, without killing them themselves like Bulgaria and Macedonia. Sometimes um, Romanians, before Antonescu got afraid of a Western victory, uh, they might do the killing themselves, which you mentioned, of course, in your book. Uh, in the Ukrainian case, yeah, in, in you know, Eastern Galicia or Western Ukraine in some areas, um, there's also a, a, a independent action on the ground. But this is not about anarchy or a lack of a, a, a destroyed state, I would say, this is a, you know, thought through and quite, let's say, consistent. You mentioned consistency uh, uh, with Hitler's ideology or coherency. I think this is a quite consistent and coherent attempt of building up a new form of, of statehood. So I think this is, you know, this is the, the, the problem I'm having with the anarchy uh, argument, and I think um, which brings back the local societies. With that, I don't want to, de you know, to detract from uh, the German responsibility or the, the Nazi responsibility. I mean, Germany was a little bigger in these times, as everybody knows in here. Um, so it was not just what we today consider as Germans. Um, but anyway, if we look at this specific, you know, Eastern, East Central European situation, then um, isn't, you know, the attempts of building up new forms yeah. of statehood uh, a major issue and yeah. not this, you know, outbursts of Hitlerist um, anarchy. And, and then again, you know, you need to get away from the big man. I mean, writing the history of, of the big man, be it Hitler, be it Stalin, and, and look to the, uh, you know, uh, go to those tens of thousands or maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. It's, it's very clarifying. So, let, let's, let's, consider, let's consider these examples a little bit more, more, more closely then. The argument ideal typically is that state destruction is the most dangerous situation for Jews and that double state destruction is the condition where the Holocaust begins. So we only have one beginning of the Holocaust, it is during double state destruction. We can decide that that's irrelevant, but I think it's, there's a pretty strong prima facie reason for thinking that it matters for the reasons that I've given. State destruction, I'm saying, is at one end of a spectrum. If you were in a Jew, in a zone of state destruction, you were almost certainly going to die. Uh, 
Soviet Union, 95%, non-Soviet Union, something like 97%, you were going to die, all right? If you were a Jew in Europe and you were from a state that was protecting you and you had a passport, you were going to live. If you were a British Jew in Berlin, you were going to survive. If you were an American Jew, I make this point just so you can see the spectrum. If you were an American Jew, you were not of any threat. If you were a Romanian Jew, taken by French authorities to the concentration camp at Drancy after 1942, you were going to survive because Romania had recognized you as a citizen. So these are the two extremes. Now, what, what, what your question is very helpful about is that it, it, it allows me to do what I would like to do, which is to say, um, and I do this in the middle chapters, that you have then a spectrum of, of situations in between. If complete state destruction is the most dangerous situation, the next most dangerous situation is one where a state is destroyed and a new puppet state is created, like Slovakia or like Croatia. Somewhere then down here in the spectrum is a state that collaborates with Nazi Germany or Nazi Germany itself. Right? And somewhere down here on the spectrum is a sovereign state that has its own anti-Jewish policy like France. So France has its own anti-Jewish policy, but nevertheless, most states are going to survive. And then here at the other end of the spectrum, you have states that are sovereign and are not involved. And by the way, this end of the spectrum is important and interesting, because if you think anti-Semitism causes a Holocaust, then you have to ask about every country in the entire world. America was a more anti-Semitic country than Latvia in the 1930s. Probably a more anti-Semitic country than Lithuania. Did we have a Holocaust? No. And like, if you're going to consider the whole you know, spectrum of possibilities, it's probably worth keeping these things in mind. All right. So there's a spectrum, and what I'm trying to suggest is that each place along the spectrum, the dangers become greater or the dangers become lesser. Auschwitz, which Philippe mentioned in the previous question, is a very good test of this. I mean, in a way, Auschwitz brings together these perspectives. Auschwitz exemplifies and symbolizes quite properly the universal aspiration to kill all Jews under German power. But the percentage of Jews who actually die from the countries where the Jews are supposed to be sent to Auschwitz varies quite radically. And the variation has to do precisely with issues of sovereignty. So when we look at Auschwitz and we say, yes, Jews from all over Europe died there, that's true. But the Jews of Denmark were supposed to be sent there, and none of them were. And there are very good reasons for that, namely that Denmark was essentially a sovereign country, and in those conditions, a Holocaust could not be perpetrated. The, the person who was in charge of the German police for, for the zone of Katowice, Katowice, which included the camp Auschwitz-Birkenau, was sent to Denmark to carry out the Holocaust. He looked at the conditions, and within a day he said, it cannot be done in conditions of a sovereign state. He knew the difference between stateless Poland and Denmark, and the difference was not that the Danes were nicer people, although that makes it a nicer story. In the conditions that Philippe are talking about, I, what I, the way, so, so Philippe also raises the very important issue of East Europeans who are trying to create their own state. This is very important for the argument. The Germans look at this as a political resource. So if Ukrainians want to join their own, want to create a state, that means they are valuable collaborators because it looks like there's something to trade. The German proposal is, you collaborate with us in killing Jews and we will help you build your state. This is a lie, but it's an effective lie, and I would make the point that it introduces politics because some of these people were anti-Semites, but not all of them. And the motive of wanting to build your own state is not the same motive as killing Jews, but nevertheless it can be turned in that direction. And that's what the Germans very effectively did, and it's one of the reasons why state destruction matters. Because if you wipe out the Estonian state, wipe out the Latvian state, wipe out the Lithuanian state, you are creating precisely people, as Philippe says, who want to rebuild states. In my argument, that is a consequence of state destruction. It's one of the reasons why state destruction matters. And, and I argue it's, it's one of the ways how the beginning of the Holocaust was possible. But then interestingly, when you move beyond the Baltic states and Western Ukraine, where there is this kind of political resource, and you move into central Ukraine and eastern Ukraine and western Russia, or into Belarus and western Russia, death rates do not actually go down. They're exactly the same. So in places where Ukrainian nationalism did not exist, in Ukraine, Kharkiv, for example, Stalino, which is now Donetsk, death rates were just as high. You got collaboration from local communists, just as you had collaboration from local 
nationalists further in the West. In Western Russia, in Smolensk, all the Jews are killed. You don't need local nationalism. Belarus is a very good case of this. Nationalism doesn't matter, but death rates are just as high. So my case is that the kind of political argument that you're talking about is important for getting the Holocaust started. It's part of the stateless case, but once it gets started, you can use the same mechanisms to further the Holocaust, even where there is no nationalism. And this is what I find so interesting. You are not safer as a Jew in Belarus than you are in Lithuania, and if so, it's by a couple percentage points. And you're not safer as a Jew in Eastern Ukraine than Western Ukraine at all. Tim, I'm wondering if you're wriggling out a bit of uh, uh, Philip's provocation because Unless I'm mistaken, a, a bunch of these Central European states wanted to get rid of their Jews well before their states were smashed by the Soviets uh, or the Germans, point one. Which, point, which, sorry, which, which ones? Well, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Uh, uh, point two, um, I, I take your point about the spectrum, the spectrum of sovereignty from states that were smashed by the Soviet Union and then reoccupied by the Nazis. So they're, as you saw, you call them black holes and where there's lawlessness and therefore uh, the, the most radical killing can take place. The other end of the spectrum are sovereign states, Denmark and so forth, which can put up some resistance to, to our Nazi designs. Hungary is a little left uh, to the right of that spectrum. Now, we're dealing with a very short time span. What if the Nazis had been more successful in the military campaign and the war had dragged on to 1950. I mean, isn't really this spectrum just about the intensity of German rule? Mm. I mean, if the Nazis had defeated the Soviet Union, my guess, it's a counterfactual to be sure, but my guess is that they would have gotten their hands on the Jews in other parts of Europe, even in Denmark, and other places where you say they were relatively safe. Now, because my questions are very short, I'm going to ask you another one, yeah, okay, please, which please, is now please. somewhat off topic. Uh, chapter three of the, of the book is uh, Das Versprechen Palestinas, the promise of Palestine. And it's about re re revisionist Zionists and their connection to uh, the Polish state and a Palestine policy. Uh, it wasn't mentioned in your brief introduction. You couldn't mention everything. I was wondering if you could flesh that out a bit for us and why that chapter is in the book at all. Okay, so um, thank you. So let me, let me talk for a minute about Poland as a state where authorities wanted to get rid of most of the Jews because it, that, the answer to that question is the same as the, or part of the answer to why I have a whole chapter about Palestine. So in a very, very broad sense, in the first part of the book, I'm trying to show readers where Jews actually lived and places where Jews might have lived, which includes Palestine, um, a dominant image both in, of Zionists but also of people who were not Zionists or who opposed Zionists. In particular, with respect to Poland, we have a very interesting development, which is that the, the, the ruling authorities of a state which has a massive thoroughgoing problem with social anti-Semitism decide to, decide to be pro-Zionist. Um, so how does this work in Polish politics? The way it works in Polish politics is that Józef Pilsudski, who was an essentially tolerant, state-minded, authoritarian, more or less dictator, dies in 1935. At that moment, the Jewish question moves into the center of politics, partly because anti-Semitism is very important on the Polish right, but also partly because the state itself seems to be at threat, and the Jewish question seems to be a way to challenge the hold of Pilsudski's successors on the state. So, the way that the authorities after 1935 handle this is they develop a policy which I call official anti-Semitism. They move Jewish matters, this is crucial, it seems like a bureaucratic de detail, it's crucial, from the Ministry of Internal Affairs to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? And so in a fundamental bureaucratic sense, Jews have been categorized as a kind of problem which the world is going to solve. Then. They undertake negotiations with the British, and, or they try to, the British are totally uninterested. They undertake negotiations with the British and the French to see about the possibility of sending Jews to Madagascar and Palestine. They actually send an investigatory commission to Madagascar, um, which, is, which is kind of a strange story. Um, and they, they're always trying to buttonhole British diplomats and talk about Palestine. The British never want to do it. Meanwhile, the, 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 the Polish state cultivates 
the first generation of radical right-wing Zionists, takes them under their wing, trains them, um, particularly in explosives and in, in terrorism and in guerrilla warfare, all, things which, all things which come in handy um, in, in, in the 1940s in Palestine, by the way. There are a lot of Polish weapons and a lot of Polish techniques involved in a lot of events which we classify as Israeli history. A lot of former Polish citizens trained in Polish military camps who do some interesting things in, in Israel. And I think that history itself is rather interesting, but there are two analytical points. The first analytical point is that I'm trying to show that anti-Semitism comes in different kinds of packages and it may have different consequences depending on what kind of idea it is. In other words, it isn't just that ideas are more or less anti-Semitic. The particular Hitlerian variety of anti-Semitism at the level of theory, at least I believe, includes the idea of statelessness. We are aiming for an anarchical racial world. The Jews are preventing us from having that world. Polish anti-Semitism, um, although it's much more widespread, generally comes in less radical articulations than that. And the Polish government is not trying, I mean, this is, it seems simple, but it's important, is not trying to create some sort of stateless zone in Europe. On the contrary, they're obsessed with the state. And their solution for the Jews, however unrealistic it might have been, <laughs> involved creating a state for the Jews. Now, I think this is worth showing because as a, just as a comparison to sort of set off how Poland and Germany were different, and that helps us to see how the Nazi version of anti-Semitism was radical. The second reason why this is so relevant is a more chronological one, and it goes back to, to Philippe's question about 1939. The Second World War had to start somehow, and it started with a Polish-German war. Why did it start with a Polish-German war? It looks on the surface like the Poles and the Germans have such similar ideas. They're both afraid of the Soviet Union. They both want to get rid of most of their Jews. The figure that the Polish government gives is 90% of its Jews. And they look superficially very similar. And German diplomats and even Hitler himself seem to have thought that they were rather similar. Between 1934 and 1938, Hitler's basic idea was that Poland was going to help in an attack on the Soviet Union. The reason why Poland didn't help had to do with Polish sovereignty. Poland wanted to be sovereign over its own Jews. It didn't understand how a war against the Soviet Union would help in some kind of deportation plan. This was one of the areas of confusion which led to the break in Polish-German relations in 1938 and 1939, which in turn led to the Second World War as we know it. Now, it goes back to Philippe's question and your question about Poland as, an, as, as a state where which one to get rid of its Jews. Yes. Exactly. Poland was a country where the ruling elite said, we would like to get rid of 90% of our Jews. And that has consequences, I believe, during the Holocaust, because it creates an image in people's minds of a Poland without Jews, of all of those empty shops and all those empty apartments. And then when that is realized after 1939, I think that does indeed forward the Holocaust. But I would argue that it is especially the case in, in, in societies where there are very real cultural divisions and where anti-Semitism is important, it's precisely then that the state matters. More than in other places, it's precisely there that the state matters. Um, and that's another point that I'm trying to make. We still have time. Um, I want to come back to your argument, but that's a, but that's now a different, a different line of line of discussion about nationalism um, as a cause. Now, I'm I'm hesitant, you know, to I'm 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 a little hesitant to to stress it because you know there's this kind of old German and also Austrian habit of you know finger pointing. Oh, in the East, you know, there are diverse nationalists and. Um, and diverse anti-Semites, and they're more clerical, and you know the whole story. Um, so this is kind of a function of, I would say, post-war uh, German or Austrian nation-building, also in a way. That's why I'm hesitating to comment again on, you know, the the nationalism in the neighboring Eastern countries. However, I think there's one thing which is specific about it. Um, we didn't talk about it yet, and that is that this nationalism and anti-Semitism, it really was a grassroots thing. Of course, also a much, to a much higher degree in Vienna than, let's say, in Berlin. Um, but, you know, you have throughout the 30s, the, the boycotts of, of, of Jewish shops, um, the kind of, you know, 
from day to day, um, I wouldn't call it discrimination. It's an attempt of marginalization in, old, in order to build up an own ethnic or national, however you want to call it, middle class. And so in that, thing, in, in that sense, I have the impression and that's a response to your comment that the death rates were the same in so many different places, which, by the way, maybe one should continue to discuss why is that like that. Um, now, again, one could point to Western Europe and, and the you know, deportation rates among non-citizen uh, Jews, of, an, uh, of so-called foreign Jews. But, but anyway, um, you know, this grassroots nationalism and anti-Semitism from below, but I think that also feeds in a lot into them um, why the Germans were able to implement, um, you know, th these high rates of killing within a fairly short amount of time. Now, but now I would like to come back to German nationalism. And this was another issue uh, in the book. You kind of said, well, you know, um, the nationalism of Hitler, um, it might have been overrated. And actually, um, maybe in his writings, yes, other points played a more important uh, role and, and probably the racism and, and the anti-Semitism were so rabid and so radical um, that you know the nationalism kind of falls back and is overshadowed. Um, on the other hand, if you look at Nazi propaganda, I think that you know this idea of a great Germany of Großdeutschland. I mean, this goal was very prominent. After all, he came from Austria, and I think undoing 1918. This was a major promise, and hey, he delivered, right? Saar, Rhineland occupation, uh, Austria, Sudetenland. Here you go. And, and I think this can only be understood, the rise of Hitler, uh, if you see this you know, great German dimension. A second dimension, I think, is anti-Polish. That comes out of imperial Germany, rather. And it is um, standing in a long and, I think, underrated uh, tradition of the Weimar Republic, right? which also acted very anti-Polish. Um, Perfect social democrats could do that at times. And um, so there are these two dimensions, but anyway, what unites them, I think, is this imperial dimension. And I think so also this whole, you know, you stress again and again that Hitler was so adamant about national self determination. Yes, in the sense that Austrians couldn't join Germany, but I think the, the real issue is this imperial vision. Um, and, and actually national expansion. And so maybe we could discuss this, uh, th that issue uh, of you know, where to place, um, well, grassroots, I would say local, regional nationalisms, but also, and of course, nation building, state building initiatives like in these areas, Macedonia, uh, borderlands of Romania, of, of, of expanded Hungary, but also then not to forget about Germany, you know, this German imperial nationalism, which I think is so pivotal for uh, national socialist propaganda. And, okay. hmm? so, so, so yeah, so all, all of these factors are important and I try to integrate all of them. The argument, the argument reaches, I think, all of them. Let me try to say very briefly why and then I want to say something about um, Dirk's point about, about time. So if we consider, um, if we consider the various kinds of nation building efforts that happen during the war, or if we consider the kinds of nationalist regimes that are in power during the war, what we do very often see, um, and I hope you'll agree since you're the greater specialist on this to me, what we often see is, is fairly straightforward attitudes of ethnic cleansing. So v Vichy France, the French state, l'état français, was anti-Semitic, but as part of a general policy of wanting to remove foreigners from France. Hungary and Romania were both anti-Semitic, but in both cases, this was part, I think, of a larger idea of creating a homogenous society. What was special in the particular political conjuncture after 1941 is that, you, ethnic, so let me put it a different way, ethnic cleansers always have a problem, which is where do you send the people that you want to cleanse? Germany solved that problem, not for all of the potential victims of ethnic cleansing, but for the Jews. 
Germany said, we will take your Jews, and therefore France had a place to send Jews. It didn't have a place to send other minorities. Therefore, Bulgaria, from its new territories, had a place to send Jews, but not its other minorities. And so, there's a combination, I think, but of what you're call of this traditional state-building homogenation with the very special condition of Germany wanting the Jews. But even here, the statelessness matters because those countries send first, not just Jews, but stateless Jews, and second, where can they send them? They can only send them to death facilities which Germany has created in stateless zones. The Jews of Vienna do not die in Vienna. They do not die in Germany. They die in Minsk, and there's a very good reason for that. It's because this is where the Germans are able to create a killing zone. Secondly, in terms of interwar nationalism, um, I think we find something very interesting, which is that the countries which look good during the war are not the countries that look good before the war. So consider Denmark, okay? The Danes, as I'm sure you all have, know, have this very nice story about boats and so on. Um, what happened in Denmark, interestingly enough, was that before the war, Denmark, after 1935, took zero German Jewish refugees. It sent them all back, and most of them were eventually killed. Lithuania, by contrast, took tens of thousands of Jewish refugees, which is worth thinking about now, right? Lithuania is a small country, like other small countries. It took tens of thousands of Jewish refugees, more than the United States, which is a big country, right? We forget about that completely because of what happened in Lithuania during the war. So interwar nationalism does not always correlate with what happens during the war. I think the destruction of states turns out to be a somewhat better explanation. And the point that you make about the middle class, here I agree completely. Um, I think it shows actually very nicely how state destruction accelerates dynamics, which I, 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 where I quite agree with your description. In Slovakia, why were Jews and Protestants discriminated against by the new regime? because, precisely, Tiso wanted to create a Slovak middle class. But how can you do that? When can you do that? You can do it at precisely the moment when Czechoslovakia is destroyed, because when Czechoslovakia is destroyed, that is your one chance and your big chance, and the Slovak leaders take it to redefine ethnic groups so that they can't own property. And when Jews can't own property, then not only can you get rid of them, but you have created the new middle class. So state destruction, I think, actually escalates or accelerates the processes that you're talking about. Time, I wanted not to forget this question. The question is, um, had more time gone on, would the Germans not have gotten their hands on all of the Jews of Europe? It's, I don't want to think too far ahead counterfactually, but I do think it's interesting to notice that as the war went on, the dynamic of occupation was the opposite of what the Germans expected. What the Germans expected was, we're going to rush into Ukraine, take all the food, and there will be an instant transformation of the planet. That does not happen. Just like in the First World War, they get much, much, much less, less food from Ukraine than they expect. Just like in the First World War, controlling Ukraine turns out to be much more complicated than one expects. That's actually a general rule, whether you're Ukrainian or not. Controlling Ukraine turns out to be more difficult than you expect. Um, but, but, but interestingly, simultaneously, France and Belgium and Denmark, these places, turn out to be much more important for precisely the supply of food, as you know very well. The, the Germans get more food from Belgium than they do from Ukraine during the Second World War. And in that situation, as time goes by, it actually becomes harder to push those countries around. So the Danish example, um, one of the arguments that has to be made, one of the arguments that Best makes when he's writing back to Berlin is, we can't disrupt things too much because we're dependent upon these guys for food. So with time, I actually see that the occupation regimes in the West are consolidating into normal regimes, whereas the ones in the East continue to permit killing to happen so long as they, so long as they exist. I don't know what would have happened if time, if, you know, if we roll the clock forward tens, you know, de decades and decades and decades, but my general sense is that it's interesting to note that the tendency in a place like France was actually to move away from the murder of Jews as, as, as time went on. Americans like to think, you know, we landed in Western Europe and we saved all the Jews. That's not actually how it happened. The Holocaust was mostly over, it mostly happened in Eastern Europe. And in Western Europe, in the first places we landed, it wasn't really going on, at least not in the same way. We should probably... Yeah.
Yeah, yeah it's fallen to me to ask you the last question. Okay. I want you to talk, if you wouldn't mind, about your conclusion. In the conclusion, Tim mentions climate change, he mentions China today and its interest in Africa, he mentions Russia and its interest in Ukraine, he mentions Israel and its taking of water from the West Bank. A whole range of climate change and resource issues. I was wondering if you could explain why that's at the end of this book and how it fits in with the big picture. So the, the, the general premise, as I hope I made clear, is that we all draw lessons from the Holocaust, right? I think it's fair to say all people of goodwill in the West draw lessons from the Holocaust. We draw lessons from the historical Holocaust as we understand it. If the Holocaust was caused by different things or by more things than we think, then the lessons that we draw from it are going to be more numerous or, or broader. So if it had to do not just with ideas and with nationalism, but it had to do more with statelessness and ecological panic, then statelessness and ecological panic are things that we might also be worrying about now. I think it's, it's, it, the historian has the duty insofar as she or he is able to, to draw attention to, to, to broad patterns of causality, because when we do that, then certain events that happen subsequently can help, can make more sense. Whether it's Rwanda or Sudan or today Syria, some of the factors that I talk about in the book are present, and some of those factors are actually under our control, right? So I also mention the American war in Iraq, right? Why do I mention the American war in Iraq? Because it was in part a result of what I take to be an improper and incorrect understanding of the Holocaust. If you think the Holocaust happened because there was an authoritarian regime oppressing its own citizens, then destroying an authoritarian regime might be a sensible thing to do. But if you think the Holocaust happened because states were destroyed, then destroying a state might not be such a sensible thing to do. And now let's look for a minute at the consequences of the American destruction of the Iraqi state. I'll put it in a very mild way. They were not what we expected, right? And in some ways, they lead directly to Syria because a million and a half Iraqi refugees go to Syria. <coughs> right after that begin four years of famine, right? Or drought, or what I call ecological panic, which despectively destroys what we used to call the Fertile Crescent which leads to two million more Syrian internal refugees from the countryside going to the cities, which brings a civil war, which brings a situation that you have now in Europe. And we can contemplate that situation in terms of evil leaders and bad ideologies, and that would be perfectly correct. But what are the things that we can change? We can decide whether or not we're going to destroy states. And in some measure, we can also decide about climate change. And I, I'm going to stress the American concerns because I think intellectuals should above all criticize their own countries. The Hitlerian ideology is one which brought together politics and science. It said that science is just another form of politics. It said that science does not offer us any kind of new perspective on the future. That is one way of creating ecological panic. If you collapse science, if you remove it from the picture, then only the present seems to matter. Instead of life being a vertical progression into some future, it's all horizontal. It's all about the surface of the earth and how much of it you can control. So when American politicians make the argument that climate science is not science but just politics, when they make the argument that there's nothing we can do to stop the catastrophes that are coming, we are doing something which, for which there is a little bit of, of history. And I think if we, if we spread the Holocaust out and look at all of its causality, it gives us good reason to check some of the things that we do or say. I mean, most immediately, Central European leaders who don't remember what Hungary, and, Hungary or Slovakia or Poland did in the years and months before the Holocaust would do well to learn about it before they talked about refugees. But I think Americans would also do well to read Mein Kampf, think about what Hitler said about the ecology, Think about Hitler's idea that panic is the normal state. Think about Hitler's claim that it's normal to want more and more and more and more all the time and that nothing else matters. I think it would help us to reconsider those things. So my own, my own sense is that insofar as we accept that the Holocaust has lessons to offer, then it matters very much how the Holocaust 
actually happened, and a broader case for that gives us reasons to worry. Not that the Holocaust will repeat in the same form, but that certain elements of it are present in the problems we have now and the problems that we might have, whether they come from the US or from Russia or from, or from China. China has a Lebensraum problem. America has a science problem. Russia has a state destruction problem. China has a Lebensraum problem. China is like Germany in that it's an industrial power, an exporting power, which cannot feed its people from its own territory. Just as Germans remember the blockade, the Chinese remember that tens of millions of Chinese were starved during the Great Leap Forward. Food is a very, very significant consideration in Chinese politics and will likely become more so. Hence, the Chinese are investing heavily, heavily in Eastern Africa, and hence they're trying to invest in Eastern Europe. There are Chinese language road signs in Minsk right now. So, um, it, so the, and these things are all connected. We, if you look at, if you consider Syria, one thing that happened is that in 2010, during the big drought of 2010, China panic bought agricultural commodities on international markets, leading to bread riots across the Middle East, leading to the Arab Spring. These things are now all connected. And one kind of argument I'm trying to make is that the Holocaust was the end, the fatal end, the worst point, not of modernity, not of enlightenment. I'm in favor of those things, but it was the end of a certain kind of globalization. We are now in a second globalization. The lessons of the first one are there for us. One of the lessons is how the Holocaust happened, and that's why those things are in the book. Thank you.